wee word of prayer before we open and read from God's holy word. Let's just take a wee moment now. Ask the Lord this morning. Let's ask the Lord this morning personally that we will hear his voice. Just ask the Lord this morning as we pray that we would hear his voice. And that we would seek the Lord to really speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, it's my prayer that Thou would speak to me. And Lord, it's all of our prayers this morning that we would hear Thy voice. And Lord, for this word that Thou hast given me, I pray, Lord, that everything will be of the Holy Spirit as I proclaim it. For I am trusting Thee for power, Lord, Holy Ghost power. For Thy power, Lord, it cannot fail. And this word that Thou hast given me, it shall and it must and it will prevail. Give us the prevailing word now, Lord. And give us the heart to receive and to apply it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, returning this morning to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, please. The book of Genesis. This week I have begun another journey through the Word of God. I'm following a new program this year. I'm following the program of Robert Murray McShane in going through the Bible in one year. I've done this now for many years. And I would love to encourage you to do the same. And you'll find it a great blessing to you. But when we came to chapter 4 this week, I was fastened to it. Genesis chapter 4. And it's from here where I feel God really wants to speak to each and every one of our hearts. And in Genesis chapter 4, verse number 1 we read, And Adam knew his wife, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she, bare, she, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first flings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, 
My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto Cain, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken in him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now, let's go down to verse number 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. And we know that God will bless that reading of his own precious truth this morning. Here in Genesis chapter number 4, we have here this morning the first family on planet earth. In Genesis chapter number 4, we have the first home ever on earth. Not only do we see the first family in the first home, but we have the first parents that was ever on this earth. And not only in Genesis chapter 4 do we find the first family, the first home, the first parents, but we have in Genesis chapter 4 this morning the first children ever born. But when we come to Genesis chapter 4 this morning, when we look at this first family, when we look at this first home, what you and I have discovered in Genesis chapter 4, something goes horribly wrong. Even in the first family, even in this first home, something goes horribly wrong. You see, child of God, when something goes horribly wrong, especially within the family, when something goes horribly wrong, especially within the home, it's so easy to give up, and it's so easy to give in. The reason being because two reasons. Number one, the hurt is almost too great to bear. Mind you, there is a lot of hurt today in homes. There is a lot of pain in homes. And many of those homes are godly homes. And many of those homes are Christian homes. When something goes horribly wrong in the family and in the home, so easy, so easy to give in, and it's so easy to give up. Because not only is the pain too great to bear, sometimes it's the discouragement that is too powerful. We come this morning to this first family. We come to this first home. You imagine this morning, think of the privilege of this new family. Think of the privilege this family had that you and I never had. You think of the parents. 
You think of the Father this morning, Adam, created by the very hand of God, not even born. You think of Adam this morning, created in the very image of God. What a privilege. What a privilege to be created by the very hand of God. What a privilege to be created in the very image of God. Well, think of this this morning. Think of the privilege Adam had of having the very breath of God go into his nostrils. Having the very breath of God going into his nostrils, that he would become a living soul, created by the very hand of God, made in the very image of God, having the very breath of God going into his nostrils. First breath Adam took came from the breath of God. Think of the privilege this morning. You think of Eve, God creating Eve, and it was God that brought Eve to Adam. And we have the first wedding, and God is the officiant. And as the Scripture says about marriage, let a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Imagine this family this morning, the father created by the very hand of God, made in the image of God. His first breath came from the very breath of God. Think of his wife created by God, brought together, married by God. There's not another family on this earth ever had that privilege. And then there was born two sons, wasn't it? Cain and Abel. Even in this home, something goes horribly wrong. I want to just say something this morning to you parents of children and young people. I have this wee fear that some today are living in this wee fantasy world. Nothing will happen to my children. My children are brought up in a Christian home. My children are go to a, a Bible-believing Sunday school in Kilkeel Baptist. My children, we attend as a family, we attend a Bible-believing church where the Word of God is taught. No, no, no. My children are sheltered from everything that's going on. No, my children will be all right. And I, I have this fear that so many are living in this wee fantasy idea that their families will be all right. Here in this first home, things went horribly wrong. And child of God this morning, parents this morning, listen, if it can happen to the first family, it can happen to your family. I have seen it time and time and time and over again. Children brought up in Christian homes rebelling. Children brought up in Christian homes no longer want the things of God. They want the things of the world. Listen, Christian parents of young people this morning, Christian parents of children this morning, please believe me. Your children are not safe. You're probably looking up at me this morning and saying, it's George McConnell, you're very pessimistic this morning. No, I'm not pessimistic. I'm just a realist. Your children are not safe from anybody. Your children are not safe like anybody else's children. I can tell you now, child of God. From day one, from when our two was born, Tracy and I prayed for them. Every night going to bed, we read to them and we prayed with them. And before we went to bed, we went into their bedroom. And when they were sound asleep, we prayed over them. 
And listen, folks, I'm not putting myself up here as some supernatural spiritual person because I'm not. I'm no different than anybody else. I'm just an ordinary 5 8 called George McConnell. Please believe me, I'm not up here to make myself out spiritual at all because, listen, I'm just the same as yourself. But that was one exercise Tracy and I did. And it's important, young parents, this morning, that you read to your children from the Word of God and that you pray with your children. And not only pray with them, even before you go to bed at night, pray over your children. But I'll tell you what that doesn't do. That doesn't guarantee that your children won't go off the rails. Even though you do all this, it doesn't guarantee that your children will not go off the rails. Listen, don't ever sit there and think your kids won't go off the rails. They can go off the rails just like anybody else's children. There was a time when one of ours did. And for a number of years, our hearts broke. And there was tears. And there was sleepless nights. And we, uh, and, and me especially, uh, and Tracy too, and we wondered, where did we go wrong? Where have we failed? We prayed. We read the Scriptures to them. We, 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 we prayed over them. Well, the one thing we didn't do, we didn't do two things. First of all, we didn't stop loving that one. And we didn't stop praying. And do you see all the praying that we did as they were growing up? Listen, they may depart from it, but God still remembers it. And just over a year ago, it was lovely to see. That's to think of what happened. I'm telling you now, child of God, maybe you're here this morning, grown-up parent, and you say to yourself, well, my children never went that road. My children never went mad. My children never went off the rails. Listen, you have grandchildren coming along, and men yet mating just be as sweet for them. something horrible happens in the family and happens in the home, I can tell you, child of God, it's so easy to run away than to remain. Don't ever think this morning it won't happen to your family. And don't think it won't happen to your son. And don't think it wouldn't happen to your daughter. But I'll tell you why. It doesn't matter what age they are. They can still go off the rail. And it doesn't matter what kind of a Sunday school they've been brought them, but it does really because that sticks with them. And listen, parents, don't you believe in teach to be leaving this morning, to believe to 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 leave all the teaching to the Sunday school, and don't believe it all to adventures, and don't believe it all to Johnny and Carly. Teach the children yourselves. Parents, it counts this morning for you to teach your children to take time and read to them the Word of God. When you have them young, pray with them, pray over them. Even though they do perhaps maybe rebel, it will stick with them. And God remembers those times. How can God remember you praying for them when you never prayed for them? How can God remember you pray, reading with them when you never once read with them? How can God remember you praying over them when you never once prayed over them? Oh, I'm telling you, child of God, don't you ever think that things couldn't go wrong in your family and in your home? My mother always drummed it into me, and I'll tell you she's right. Never you criticize another parent's. Never you criticize another family's children for the way they've turned out until you have reared your own. And when you have reared your own, still keep your mouth shut for you don't know what way they could go even later on in life. And you see here, child of God, here in Genesis chapter 4, 
God wants us to see something this morning. He wants us to learn something this morning. And it's this. Here we have Satan's plan. Satan's plan to infect Adam with the virus of sin. Before the first person was born, in Genesis chapter 3, we can see where he accomplished that plan because Adam fell. Satan knew once he got Adam to fall this morning, he would get the rest of us. And you and I have been infected by that same plague of sin. Remember what we read in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. As by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and death has passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And Satan accomplished that plan. What does Paul say? 1 Corinthians 15, 22. It says this, As in Adam all die. The strategy of Satan was to break the lineage of Christ from day one. Here in Genesis 4 this morning, we have the first death, the first human death. Cain rose up against his brother Abel, uh, Abel and his brother and slew him. Genesis 4, you've got the first murder. Genesis 4, you've got the first murderer recorded. Imagine what Adam and Eve must have felt like. Imagine their pain. Imagine their anguish. Imagine their loss. Do you ever go into a home of a murdered son? Do you ever experience that pain? Saturday night, the 26th of February, 1983, I walked into a wee home in Mully Rodden between Ochnacloy and Indiana. It was the home of a murdered son, 22 years of age. Shot dead sitting in his car, waiting for the work to open. Part-time member of the Ulster Defence Regiment. I remember walking into the wee orlet and I remember being brought into the bedroom. I didn't want to go in, but I was brought in, and there Cecil was lying in the coffin. And I can see wee John, his father, he had leaning over the coffin and crying, and I can see his mother leaning over the coffin yet and saying, they riddled him, they riddled him, they riddled him. Where I often wondered, how did John McNeil and other parents cope with such loss? Because here this morning in Genesis chapter 4, something goes horribly wrong, not outside the home, but inside the home. And something goes horribly wrong in the home and in this home. The thing we have to realize, God is still in control. Listen, you might not see it, you might not feel it, but listen, He is. And the future this morning might seem impossible to face. But there's two things God wants you and I to do in this passage this morning. Two very simple things. One thing. God doesn't want you and I to focus on Adam and Eve this morning. God doesn't want you and I to focus on Cain or Abel. God wants you and I to focus on Him this morning Himself. And to see Him. To see God in the situation. Because there's a lot of things that we can learn from ourselves when we look at God in this situation, in this home, when something horribly went wrong. You know the first thing I noticed the other morning? As I read this passage over and over and over again, the first thing I learned was this, was God's interest in it all. Do you know something, child of God, this morning? Whatever happens in the home, painful it may be, disappointing it may be. Maybe disgraceful as it may be. God sees it all. And God knows it all. And God understands it all. I, I don't know if there's anything going on in your home today. 
But there's times you can't get your head around certain things. Listen this morning. There's certain things happens in life even though you cannot get your head around it, God is in control of it all. God stepped into this situation. You know, here's the first question it raised. If God is so loving, if God is so kind, why did God allow this to happen? If God is so loving and God is all knowing, God knowing the heart of Cain, knowing the plans of Cain, why did God not step in and stop Cain from killing his brother? Sometimes when things happen in the home, sometimes when things happen in the family, when things happen in the life, we often question God. God, why did you not step in for? Why did you not bring this to a, a no winner? See, what we have to learn is this, child of God. God at the very beginning gave man something that is very precious. But man destroyed it. And you know what it was? It was a free choice. And man's choice at the beginning was to disobey God. That's where it all begins today. Man chose to disobey God. And because of man's disobedience, what happened? It brought in death. It brought in destruction. Listen, another wee question, another wee thought God wants to leave with parents today. Parents, listen. Daddies, listen to me. Be you careful, daddy, the way you live. Because there's a wee lad coming after you, perhaps, and he wants to be like his daddy. Mama, be you careful this morning. There's a wee lassie watching you. And she wants to be like her mama. And the way we live as parents will determine perhaps in many ways the path your children's going to take. And if you're an unsaved parent this morning, you be very careful because you have children coming after you. And if you're rejecting Christ and walking away from the cross and refusing to get saved. Listen, you're not only taking yourself to hell, you could be taking your children to hell. So I take a look at this first family this morning. Abel, he learned, all right, he learned from his parents the true way of sacrifice. He learned the true way of worship. Cain learned disbelief and disobedience, and I'm not going to point the finger as to who he learned that from this morning. Remember, parents, your children watch you, and your children follow you. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 12, do you remember Abraham? Abraham, he took the, took the fear, and he went down into Egypt you remember the story? He went down to Egypt. He told lies about Sarah being his sister, and he went on like that there. And do you remember Isaac done the same thing twice? Who did he learn that from? He learned it from his father. That's who he learned it from. His old fatherly nature followed into Isaac. And parents, listen to me. Listen, child of God. Here's what God wants you to see. God comes into this situation in Genesis chapter 4, even though it was a horrible law. He steps in. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I thy brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Listen, God steps in. God's interest in it all. Know something, child of God? Here's what God wants us to see this morning. Life and hope never ends when all seems lost. When everything that you have is lost, this morning God has something else. When everything is taken from us, when everything that is precious, listen, God always has something else. It may be overwhelming at the present. It's not the end of the story. story. God is at work right now. For Adam and Eve, God was working in their pain. 
For Adam and Eve, God was working in their grief. For Adam and Eve, God was working in their loss. What do we often quote Romans 8, 23, 28? For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and for them who are called according to His purpose. And listen, perhaps there's so many today and something has happened and you can't bear it. Perhaps something will happen and you can't bear it and you don't know what way to turn and you don't know, friend, what to do, what to say, one thing or another thing. Here's my advice. Whatever has happened, whatever is happening, I'll tell you what you do. Listen, this is from the Lord. It's not from me. You just keep your hands off it. You just step back and you let the Lord do His work. Because the Lord is in control. God is sovereign this morning in all things, and His plans are not frustrated by the foolish and sinful ways of mankind. Nothing is out of control when God is in control. Ephesians 1 verse 11 we read, He worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. Do you know what Satan was trying to do here? He was trying this morning to, to break the lineage of Christ. That's what he was trying to do. In chapter, chapter 6, he tries to pollute the lineage of Christ when he and his angels tried to get the godly line of Seth to have uh, marry into the godless line of Cain. In Exodus, he tried to break it by by the bondage of the, Egypt, the Jews in Egypt. He tried to break it in the days of Esther. He tried to break it when Herod tried to kill the Lord Jesus himself. But every time, every time the devil tried to pollute or to break the lineage of Christ, God wither out with him every time. Many years ago in the early last century, an artist who was a great chess player painted a picture of a chess game. There was two players. One was a young man. The other was Satan. The young man, he played with the white pieces, Satan, the black pieces. The issue of the game was this. Should the young man win? He would be forever free from the power of evil and from the power of sin. And should the devil win, the young man would be his slave forever. As the artist stepped down to paint this picture, he evidently believed in the supreme power of the devil for the picture. The picture presented the devil as the victor. In the conception of the artist, the devil had just moved his queen and had announced in checkmate in four moves. The young man's hand hovered over his rook, his pale face with amazement. There was no hope the devil win. He was to be a slave forever. For years, this picture hung in the great gallery. Chess players from all over the world came and viewed the picture. They did succumb to the idea in the thought of the armist that the devil always wins. After several years, one chess player by the name of Paul Murphy came, an undefeated world champion. He studied the picture. Five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes came. Oblivious of all that's going around him, he was concentrating on this picture. 35 minutes passed, 45 minutes came, and suddenly his eyes lit up. And his eyes burned with the vision of an unthought of combination. Suddenly he shouted, young man, young man, make that move. There's a move there the devil hasn't seen. It's not checkmate. Make the move. And to the amazement of the artist who himself was there, the supreme chess personality, had discovered a combination that the creator and the artist had not considered, and the young man defeated the devil. Listen, child of God, 
Don't you and try and play chess with the devil in your situation. You just let God make the moves for you. God makes no mistakes. God is interested in it all. I'm going to finish with God's intervention in it all because this was actually my text this morning. Verse number 25. Listen to what it says. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. I love this wee bit because this is what really intrigued me. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Do you know what Seth means? The name Seth means appointed. The name Seth means compensate. And what God wants you tonight to learn this morning is this. No matter how hopeless, no matter how horrible, no matter how awful any situation may be, your life and my life won't unravel if we put our trust in God alone. When I learned one day, I was called into Derek Loan's office. And business was bad. At that time, business was crazy. It was, there was nothing to do in the car business. Derek Loan put me in four weeks' notice to pay me off. Here I was, just married, mortgage, wee baby girl. How am I going to face this? What I had to learn to do, I had to learn to trust God in God. That evening, Tracy happened to run in to a couple who we were friendly with to tell them to pray. And as Tracy told Peter and Roberta, Peter and Roberta says, for funny, you should come here tonight because there's a man who approached us, Paul Thompson, was looking somebody to work on the trade counter and somebody like George would be perfect. I went for a job interview, got the job in Paul Thompson's. And even though Derek Lone was a godly man, and that's where I, and I have to thank God all my days for Derek Lone. Yet God brought me to Paul Thompson's, and I met a man there called Joe Thompson, and Joe was Paul's father. He's Paul's father. And where I am today in my Christian life, God used Joe Thompson. Joe was never a preacher, never a pastor, never a public person, but anything I have learned to do with the Christian life and the ministry, I picked it up from Joe. What's God trying to say? Listen, when things happen bad in the present, God has something always better in the future if you only learn to trust You may lose a business deal. You may lose your job. Things may go horribly wrong in your family and in your home. You don't know what one of your teens going to bring you. But listen to me. All is not lost no matter how horrible it may seem. God hath appointed me another seed. God didn't give up. God stepped in and took over to fulfill his plan. And God will step in and fulfill plan in his, your life and in your family and in your home, even though this morning you cannot understand how the thing is this this morning, just stand back and let God do his work in whatever that may be. But listen, parents, as I bring this meeting to a close, you imagine Adam and Eve every time they saw Cain, the pain he must have brought them, the hurt he must have brought them, the heartache, and that heartache was renewed every time they looked upon him. 
Every time they saw his face, that's what they thought, you murdered your brother. The disgrace, the hurt, the pain, the sorrow, the grief. And that's why, parents, don't believe in it up to Sunday school teachers now. Don't believe in it to Johnny and Caroline. Don't believe in it to the adventurers. Don't believe in it to the crash folk. Don't believe in it. You get the Word of God into your children. Now you've only one go at it, and you pray with them, and you pray over them. Because you don't know what the future holds for your children or your grandchildren. If it happened in the very first home that God created and God brought together, it can happen to your home and me. But God knows. God understands. May God bless His word to our hearts this morning. Our